Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Brian Runk. I'm at the University of, uh, of Minnesota. I'm a PhD student in the Geography, Environment, and Society Department. Uh, and it, it is my pleasure today to be able to introduce Lee Tespazion. Uh, I had the, I had, you know, kind of the serendipitous uh, opportunity to, to sit next to Lee at the agent-based modeling uh, uh, conference uh, this past spring. And I just sat down and, um, and we were introduced and I, it, I was able to have one of the most interesting conversations that I've had about the design of, uh, of agent decision modules that, I've, that I think I've maybe ever had actually. And, um, and I, I don't know the, the conversation was probably just one of those things for Lee that happened in passing. Um, but I, I certainly, um, appreciate and grew a lot as a student through, through talking to her there. Um, we, in putting together the webinar series, um, Lee was uh, gracious enough to, to be willing to, to talk to us. And um, for those of you that don't know uh, agent-based computational economics and don't know uh, Lee's work um, as, as well, you know, Lee has been a leader in, um, in really thinking through how it is that, uh, that agent-based ways of understanding the world and, um, and complexity can be applied to economic systems. And as a result, because of the large influence that economics has um, in other domains, um, you know, so in, in geography, we look a lot to Lee's work as, um, a, a, you know, as kind of a gold standard for how we can go about thinking about coupled human environment systems. Um, she, she has all sorts of uh, important and interesting work in energy markets. Um, and then, and she also uh, has done quite a bit of work in coupled human environment interactions at the, at the watershed scale, which she's published on recently quite a bit. And I, I'll plug all those papers, which I, I think she'll be um, talking a little bit about today. Um, Lee's work really sets out kind of, a, like I said before, a gold standard for um, what I think we want to be doing in the agent-based community, though. And so with that, um, I will pass it over to Lee. And uh, she's going to talk to us today. Um, her talk is titled Modeling Coupled Natural and Human Systems as Locally Constructed Sequential Games. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, greetings to everyone from Iowa. And I would first like to thank Brian uh, for inviting me to participate in your webinar. It's a, it's a really great pleasure. Um, my understanding from Brian is that many of you listening are interested in the modeling of human decision making and human environment interactions. And although you are perhaps familiar with agent-based modeling at a general level, you're not sure what precisely agent-based modeling might have to offer you as an additional tool in your modeling toolkits. So consequently, what I've done today is title my talk, Modeling Coupled Human and Natural Systems as Locally Constructed Sequential Games. And uh, what I'll be doing uh, during the talk is I'm going to first try to make the case that real-world coupled natural and human systems, or CNH systems for short, constitute what I call a locally constructed sequential game. I'm then going to provide a brief but uh, careful review of modeling principles for a particular form of agent-based modeling that permits CNH systems to be modeled and studied as locally constructed sequential games. And uh, I just want to mention that although I refer to this approach as agent-based computational economics, or ACE for short, I do believe that, in fact, it provides a useful modeling approach for any real-world system involving complex interactions among social, physical, and institutional entities. So I will first illustrate the applicability of ACE for a watershed governance study in which a city manager and farmers strategically interact to manage various types of risks within a watershed basin that's subject to flooding. And then I'll illustrate how ACE modeling tools could permit rich, uh, edgier explorations in which the model agents have many non-standard types of capabilities important for social systems. For example, um, I'll talk about ACE modeling, uh, how it permits agents to actually talk back and forth with each other at event-triggered times and using adaptively formulated communication, which is the way, of course, real people do communicate. So my intention today is to move rather quickly through these illustrative materials um, in order to leave plenty of time for any discussion or questions that, that people may have. So on slide two, 
uh, slide three actually, let me get that turned, slide three, um, roughly speaking, what is a sequential game? It's, it's uh, also referred to as an extensive form game, and it's a type of get dynamic game in which multiple players undertake sequential decision making so that at a minimum, each player knows its own decision history, and that decision history is changing over time, so the states of the players evolve over time. So that's what you really mean by a sequential game. And on slide three, I argue that real-world CNH systems, coupled natural and human systems, constitute locally constructed sequential games. Um, their essential properties uh, include they have heterogeneous participants, participants that differ in their key attributes. They are open-ended dynamic systems. There, There's no set time uh, end. There's no set end of the world that's uh, imposed on the model. They have agents with local constructivity, meaning all agents are constrained to act at any given time on the basis of their own states at that time. And they're reflexive, which means the actions taken by agents at any given time affect states at subsequent times. On slide four, I then introduce agent-based computational economics as a modeling methodology that permits the modeling of CNH systems as locally constructive sequential games. And I'm roughly defining ACE here as the computational modeling of real-world systems as open-ended dynamic systems of interacting agents. And um, this rough def definition is not pre precise enough, however, to distinguish ACE from other useful but distinct modeling approaches such as microsimulation and system dynamics. So what I've done is I've put together, uh, in, in response to communication with people from microsimulation and system dynamics and other fields, I've put together, um, starting on slide five, uh, some specific modeling principles that help to distinguish the ACE modeling approach from these other modeling approaches, all being useful, all being parts of uh, uh, an appropriate toolkit, but still having distinctions that might be important for one application or another. So on slide five, the very first modeling principle, MP1, provides a concise definition for an ACE agent. And unlike other agent-based modeling approaches, in ACE, an agent is broadly defined to be any software entity within a computationally constructed world that is capable of acting over time on the basis of its own state. And another thing that distinguishes ACE, the concept of the state is very broad. It's interpreted very broadly to include data, attributes, and methods. And I list here some of the key examples of what those components of a state could be. On slide six, I give you an example of, uh, that, that really reinforces MP1 in the sense that it specifically addresses agent scope. It says an agent can be in, an individual, a social grouping, an institution, a biological entity, and or a physical entity. And this is an example from a watershed model that I'll be talking about later in the presentation. But in contrast to many agent definitions, the thing to note here is that I do not restrict ACE agents to be human representations. And I, ACE definition of agent is simply in accordance with the standard dictionary meaning of an agent as any entity able to take actions that affect subsequent events. Um, in a final reference paper on the final slide of this talk, I'll point to a paper where I elaborate quite extensively on this point because it's a very important point, the fact that ACE models are fully agent-based. I think it's a very important point um, that, that uh, creates some uh, ability to do a comprehensive modeling from a, from a, from a principle of agents that's fully incorporated um, into the modeling. Um, I illustrate on slide six, the um, agent taxonomy for a watershed study, again, to be discussed more carefully in a few slides down. But the agents here you can see include physical entities, land, hydrology, climate, a city levy system. They also include institutional entities here in the form of two different types of markets. And they include human entities here in the form of farmers and city managers. 
So this is a, this is a sort of semi-UML diagram uh, of the key agents in, in this watershed study. On slide 7, uh, the three additional ACE modeling principles are given. Um, the first one, MP3, requires ACE agents to be locally constructive, which I've already uh, characterized previously, um, dependence on own state for actions taken at a given time. MP4 requires the modeler to respect agent autonomy. And this one, I think, is pretty, pretty important in terms of the distinguishing of this ACE approach from other approaches. MP4 means the modeler is not permitted to impose top-down, free-floating restrictions on agents in order to achieve some kind of desired coordination state, in particular, a coordination state desired by the modeler, but not necessarily something that the agents themselves either would do or could do based on their actual own states. So MP4 really does require the modeler to have hands off after the initial conditions are set, the modeler is supposed to respect the autonomy of the agents to evolve over time under their own dynamics. MP5 further reflects this point by saying the ACE model system is completely specified in terms of its interacting agents so that the state of the system at any given time is determined fully by the ensemble of agent states at that time. That does permit emergence, but again, it says hands off with regard to the modeler being able to impose additional coordinating restrictions on the system as the system is evolving, where those additional coordination restrictions do not come from the agents themselves. That's what we're trying to prevent here. And finally, on slide eight, the final couple of principles here, system historicity. Again, these are not independent of each other, all these modeling principles, they really are supportive as a whole of a, of a viewpoint. And MP6 says, uh, it really expresses the goal of many agent-based modelers, which is to model real-world systems as dynamic systems that unfold through time, that really do unfold through time as historical process. The final one here just reemphasizes again the uh, role of the modeler the intended role of an ACE modeler as an experimentalist. Now, just like a biologist experimenting with cultures in Petri dishes, the ACE modeler has complete control over initial conditions. However, once these initial conditions are set, the model cover, if you will, is closed, and the modeled system thereafter evolves over time without further interventions from the modeler. So slide nine summarizes all of this together by again emphasizing that the analogy to biology uh, is sought here where biologists are experimenting with cultures and petri dishes. And an ACE model, similarly, is intended to be a computational laboratory that permits users to explore how changes in initial system conditions affect system outcomes over time, again, like a culture in a petri dish. And I just, again, to, to, because these principles are, 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 are quite important uh, to distinguish ACE from other approaches, I'll just say again, the ACE requirement that agents be autonomous, conditional on initial agent specifications, is what distinguishes ACE from many other modeling approaches, particularly within economics. These other approaches within economics, for example, that permit a modeler to impose equilibrium conditions on agents that these agents would not satisfy or indeed could not satisfy by means of their own actions. In slide 10, I will now um, you know, move relatively quickly through a number of illustrative ACE studies uh, with a particular stress on aspects important for the study of CNH, coupled natural and human systems. And if time runs out, I'll just skip to the end uh, to my wrap-up uh, materials so as not to uh, impinge on discussion and question time. Slide 7 summarizes uh, three key, key features of an ACE watershed governance study that recently appeared in environmental modeling and software. The, the, the key, three key features first, the study is based on an ACE watershed platform developed entirely in Java which permits the study of interactions among hydrology, climate, and strategic human decision-making over time. Second key feature, 
the platform is used to implement an ACE watershed model, a test case, if you will, that's based on the Squaw Creek watershed in central Iowa. And this model was used as a base model for an iterative participatory modeling, or IPM, effort with Squaw Creek watershed stakeholders. Um, another feature of the watershed model, we used the oversight design and details protocol, the ODD protocol of uh, Volker, Grimm, and others, uh, to present this model to the readers of the EMS article. And finally, the third key feature is that the watershed platform itself, the ACE watershed platform, the library of software um, that uh, implements the test case, the watershed model, has been released as open source at a website repository. On slide 11, I um, indicate the nature of the physical watershed base in the Squaw Creek watershed basin in central Iowa uh, that we were using as our empirical uh, test case. And uh, this is the watershed we wanted to capture key features of in our watershed model. And uh, slide 13, or slide 12, uh, then depicts how we did in, indeed attempt to capture these key features. Uh, we have a basin that has a creek running through it. Um, we have various types of decision-making agents uh, strategically interacting within an environment that includes both physical and market processes. Um, as in the Squaw Creek watershed, we have in particular farmers in the up uh, the, the uh, up side of the watershed, the, the uh, upriver side. And then we have a city, uh, Ames in fact, uh, in the south region with a city manager who's very worried about flooding, which we do get in Ames, very worried about taking flood mitigation measures to uh, mitigate flood damage in the city. And so these, these uh, decision makers interact over time to manage their risks for the farmer. Uh, the risks come from uncertain weather, uncertain market prices, and uncertain actions of the city manager in terms of setting of a subsidy rate for water retention land. And for the city, the uncertainty comes from the weather and the reaction of the farmers to its subsidies in terms of how much land they will allocate to water retention versus production of uh, crops. Um, slide 13 reprises the agent taxonomy for the ACE watershed model, uh, this, this particular model of the Squaw Creek watershed that I showed earlier, so I, I won't uh, go over it again. And then slide 14 um, shows the flow diagram for the ACE watershed model. And again, if people are interested, we can come back to this and look at this more carefully in terms of what the dynamic uh, flows are the, of, of interactions among all these different agents. We do have, uh, uh, I do have a picture here on slide 15 that simply depicts the sources of uncertainty for the farmer. And we had to model very carefully the way the farmer would uh, realistically be able to take into account these three sources of uncertainty in attempting to not only, not only prosper, but, but even just to survive as a solvent farm over time in this watershed model in the face of uh, these three sources of uncertainty. And so, indeed, um, if the farmer did not uh, earn enough profit uh, in each period to cover its costs, uh, the farmer would have to leave or exit the watershed basin. And the city manager also is very worried about flooding, has a budget to allocate. If it runs out of funds, <laughs> okay, uh, then there's a big risk that it will not be able to take measures, uh, particularly the, uh, the uh, management of the levy, uh, investments to keep the quality of the levy high, sufficiently high, uh, it will then risk having uh, lots of damage occurring to the city from um, flooding. Um, slides 16 and 17 um, just indicate illustrative findings. Um, uh, again, uh, if time permits, we can come back and talk about it. But essentially what we did was a test case where we allowed the farmer First, to not worry about risk, and so just maximizing uh, expected profit uh, without any risk uh, aversion aspects included in that optimization problem. And then the second one is we permitted, we, we set the farmer's objective a little differently so that it was concerned with both expected profit and variance of profit. It was concerned with risk aversion and then was concerned with the outliers of the bad years with the rain, 
um, the weather conditions or the prices of, of, of corn or inputs um, or the subsidy rates were set in such a way as to cause the farmer to be at risk for not being able to cover its costs um, and to sustain itself. So what we found, the ba a basic finding that's quite interesting is farmers without risk aversion the resulting under different types of scenarios we had scenarios for weather and for prices so the different weather and prices uh, coming in from the markets um, under these we had uh, 32 different uh, 31 different uh, scenarios and what we're seeing here is the resulting welfare of the farmer under these uh, 31 different scenarios and they're really very volatile when the farmer is not taking precautions uh, in terms of mitigating risk the volatility across the scenarios is very high when the farmer instead takes into account the possible distribution of the, its uncertainty the possible um, deviations from normal weather patterns and the possible deviations from normal prices for corns, corn sale and inputs, um, when it does take those uh, risks into account, then across the scenarios we see much less volatility um, because, again, the farmer is self-insuring itself uh, by the actions it takes uh, to make sure that it is not subject to as higher risk in these uh, outlier circumstances. So anyway, if you're interested, again, we can come back and talk more carefully about these kinds of outputs. We also did the same thing for the city. We we asked what about city social welfare under the same 31 scenarios. Once again, when the farmer takes risk uh, measures to avert risk uh, versus when it does not, the city outcomes become less volatile, volatile as well. So that's interesting because we're looking here for an alignment of objectives between city manager and farmers. Uh, something that aligns their objectives together so that indeed both of them can improve their welfare together and that the particular mechanism we're looking at is the ability of the city manager to pay a subsidy to the farmer for additional uh, water retention land which is then to the benefit of the farmer in terms of a source of revenue but also to the benefit of the city's social welfare in the sense of mitigating risks of flood. On slide um, 18, um, I would like to just quickly, uh, we are you know, getting a little close to the 10.30 hour. On slide six, uh, 18, I would like to just um, briefly discuss various what I call edgier types of exploration that are permitted by ACE modeling. And these are listed in summary form on slide 18, so let me just quickly go through them. And, and then again, if, we're, if anyone's interested, we can return to... Uh, to a discussion. But first of all, agents in ACE can be modeled as, to quote the fam famous Einstein quote, simple but not too simple, for the purpose at hand. And I would like to suggest in the next few slides a couple of ways that I uh, mean uh, modeled simple but not too simple. Um, in addition, ACE modeling principles can be used as real-world design principles. We're actually doing this in our electricity projects. We're using ACE modeling principles to design an architecture for an electric power distribution system that's built from the bottom up and is built on agent interaction principles so that it works in a very decentralized, controlled way. And this is, uh, has a lot of advantages in terms of communications and uh, cybersecurity and other aspects. We're also uh, in, in ACE, I would argue, uh, permits uh, researchers to at least strive to achieve a comprehensive uh, form of empirical validation, and I'll list that more carefully on a slide to come. And then there's another aspect that I've been stressing, the ability of ACE to support uh, or to, to uh, um, help in developing sta standardized policy readiness levels. ACE can help to bridge a gap between models that are, have a very low policy readiness, they're in a very high, highly abstract or conceptual form, uh, to bridge the gap between those conceptual kinds of studies and what industry and government uh, and regulatory agencies are interested in, which is real-world implementation, first in field studies and then in actual real-world uh, implementation in practice. So I would like to talk just a little bit about how the role of ACE platforms in enabling policy researchers to bridge this very difficult gap between concept and implementation. And then finally, I'd like to just talk about 
uh, it's not just uh, agent-based modeling, but uh, that there's a whole spectrum of experiment-based models, experiment-based models, spanning all the way from just purely human to completely computer agent. There's all these things in between where we mix the, the number of humans and computer agents within the model, and a very interesting um, additional capabilities are, uh, are enabled by that mixing. So I'd like to talk briefly about that. So anyway, uh, just to just uh, just to stress a, c a couple of these uh, slides in the edgier exploration part of the talk, um, ACE biological and social agents can be subject to physical and institutional constraints, talk back and forth with each other. This is very easy to implement, say, within a Java program. It's very easy to implement communication between agents, and these communications can be very adaptive. It's possible to have partners be able to choose and refuse who they partner with. That is, formation of networks uh, can be uh, um, researched and uh, studied. It's possible for the partners to behave strategically within partnerships and then to evolve their behavioral strategies over time. So what we're seeing here is, a, for example, in this labor market study that's just cited, is the ability to combine game theory with matching theory. So we have both matching of partners by choice and refusal, and we have the game aspect of choosing how to behave in any march, matched partnership. And then you have the evolutionary theory where you can actually evolve your strategies over time based on your past experiences. All of these things were discussed in this article, but uh, still today, we see agents with uh, very restricted um, capabilities being used, but, but actually these additional capabilities are not hard to implement. And for a social system, uh, I, a CNH system with, with social aspects, of course, human and uh, coupled human and natural system with social interaction, um, these may be very important additional capabilities to at least consider. Maybe not, but maybe they are. So I just wanted to mention that. And then in this earlier work uh, that led to this uh, trade network game laboratory where it's an open source software platform allowing um, people to play around with different kinds of um, games in which there's endogenous choice of partners and evolution of strategies. Um, just to mention a few more things, we're almost out of time here, but ACE modeling principles is real world design principles. Um, I have this forthcoming chapter in a handbook that explains this much more extensively, but what you see in this picture, which I have no time to describe, is uh, a way in which we have a duality where ACE modeling can be used to represent and study a real world system, but it can also be used the modeling principles can be used to actually design the system. And this is what I mentioned earlier, that we're really using agent-based modeling principles to design architectures, not just for distribution systems, electric power distribution, but for end-to-end -end power systems stretching all the way from distribution, which is retail, all the way up to wholesale electric power markets. We are actually looking at redesigning these systems from end to end uh, based on more decentralized control architectures that incorporate modeling design principles such as the ones that ACE is based on. In the um, next slide, uh, I do start this discussion of empirical validation, but I'll just be very brief here to say that, that at least in economics, uh, because of analytical tractability concerns, some aspects of empirical validation are short. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're not explored fully as they could be. And this, on this slide 21, I mentioned two of these where I think many economic models do have more difficulty because of the need for analytical tractability. One is on input validation. Uh, are the exogenous inputs to the model empirically meaningful and appropriate to the purpose at hand? And then, in particular, process validation. How well do the model physical processes, biological processes, institutional arrangements, and social behaviors, how well do these all reflect real-world aspects important for the purpose at hand? It's the process validation at least within economics. It's the process validation which seems to be where many economic models um, take a shortcut by presuming equilibrium conditions 
instead of thinking carefully and attempting to understand constructively the processes by which coordination is or is not achieved by agents interacting among themselves and uh, in charge of their own lives. Uh, the last two parts of empirical validation, and descriptive output validation, in, in sample fitting and out of sample forecasting, these are typical and common in economic models. But the point here is to put all four together and uh, to say that ACE modeling at least permits researchers to strive for all four aspects of empirical validation, not just the last two. For standardized policy readiness levels, uh, again, time is so short. I just want to say that this has been a very useful idea in the, our work in electric power markets. I do not know how useful others will find it, but it's been very useful to, to try to think carefully about how models are differentiated by their, mo by their level of development from concept to implementation. And by putting down these nine different levels, it reveals really that there's a very um, a sparse number of studies in the policy readiness levels four through six. There really is much more work going on in PRLs one to three and then seven to nine, but four to six represents a very difficult uh, gap uh, in, in modeling. And I call it the valley of death because um, when university researchers uh, come up with some really great ideas at policy readiness levels one through three, they find it impossible to sell those ideas directly to industry because industry requires a more comprehensive type of modeling with greater attention to prototyping uh, to actual physical reality. And so there's this gap where these good ideas can simply die. And so what I'm arguing here is that I have found in my own work in electric power markets that ACE is well suited for bridging this gap because it permits the construction of computational platforms in policy readiness levels four through six that bring conceptual ideas all the way up to the ability to be implemented in a field study. So that, I think, is a very important uh, topic uh, for further work for people interested in the normative side of ACE, which is you know, the, the, the use of ACE to do mechanism design, market design, general normative design for institutions and policies. Okay, and this is the final slide I really will, will put here, but I, this is the one I find kind of interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this possibility of doing experimental type uh, approaches, modeling approaches um, uh, for coupled natural and human systems or any other systems involving people interacting with physical and institutional processes. And I'm thinking, well, you know, we really don't have to be either <laughs> all, uh, human, all human, 100% you know, human, or 100% computational agent, we have the ability now, and with deep learning, with, deep, uh, with, with serious games, I should say, with serious games, uh, we, we, we are already seeing uh, people beginning to explore the interim types of models where you have various degrees of interaction between human and computer agents. And again, in a reference paper I'll give you in a second, um, I talk about this much more extensively, the advantages of, of trying to actually fill in and work with models that occur in the interim uh, levels here between the two endpoints, um, how, how the advantages that might um, provide for economists and other social scientists, and, and in fact, indeed, anyone working with, again, coupled natural, human, and physical systems. Okay, so just to conclude then, I, do, I believe ACE is a useful modeling approach for studying real-world systems, in particular CNH, and um, I've tried to present some ACE modeling principles to clarify uh, in what ways this approach differs from other useful approaches uh, that, that are perfectly good approaches for different purposes, but that this approach really does put a stress on this exploration in analogy to biological experimentation. Much remains to be done. We certainly do need much more work on empirical validity, policy readiness levels, presentation protocols, edgier explorations, uh, demonstrate value added for big time applications, killer applications are often called, exploring spectrum of models and so forth. Um, this is all discussed with um, 
greater care in the references on the final slide here. Um, the ACE home site, website uh, has a, a, a very extensive pointers, annotated pointers, to work in a wide variety of uh, areas. In particular, it has a pointer to a website on CNH systems that might be of interest to to people listening to this uh, talk. And then in terms of background papers that explore these uh, more carefully and systematically, these ideas presented on the previous slides, I present two of these, uh, or I give you two of these papers here with um, pointers to uh, preprints that people can examine if they're interested. So thank you again very much. And uh, that is the end of the formal presentation. And I'm happy to take questions and enter into any discussion people may want to do. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, that was absolutely fabulous. Um, we'll open the the floor for for questions now. Um, of course, I've got like a, a huge page of them, so I I, I it, oh. it's hard for me not to just to jump in right away. <laughs> but we'll um, we'll see if, if Buffalo or uh, or M Michigan State has anything first. Okay, I got a question. So um, we can see you introduced us about this whole spectrum of different kinds of way of modeling. Um, do you uh, do you find you have a very specific um, genre of uh, philosophy under the the model the whole modeling process? Do, do I? I'm sorry. Could you just repeat the last part? It was a little unclear. I'm sorry. Yeah. Do, do, yeah I, um, do you do you have um, kind of a specific um, a genre of philosophy like um, phenomenology or reflexive? Oh, modeling yeah. <laughs> well, it might help you to understand. Yeah, it might help you to understand where I'm coming from if I tell you that I was a his history major as an undergraduate, <laughs> coming into economics from history. My first yep. question to my professor was, "Where are the people?" And um, I, I did feel that. Um, it's important, you know, not there's lots of different modeling approaches, but I feel it's important to at least be able, uh, for some purposes, to model processes historically as occurring as open-ended dynamic systems without imposing equilibrium or top-down restrictions. I mean, I'm just very, very much interested in myself in exploring um, processes as, from a historical point of view, as a cause and effect, without me interfering in the dynamics to try to achieve some equilibrium that I'm interested in, I prefer to see what the system does under its own dynamics, starting from initial conditions that I care about. So that, in terms of philosophy, I'm not a philosopher, but that's really what's motivating this whole approach, is my very deep interest in history. Okay, thank you. So Lee, I'm, I'm really curious to get your perspective on, uh, in, the, in the land change science community, we talk a lot about the heuristic value of, of agent-based models and, you know, kind of your, your point about um, policy readiness, I, I feel like it is in some ways a challenge to our community um, to, to kind of push towards realism. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you could comment on, you know, ABM, kind of what you're observing in ABM at large and, um, you know, and how it is that maybe communities like land change science can move more towards that kind of mezzo um, arena for, for policy readiness and, and modeling. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not a specialist in your areas and, and, and I really, what I'm familiar with most is economic, uh, macroeconomics, in fact, which I teach. I've been teaching graduate macroeconomics for 20 years. Um, what I have seen that's been bothersome and, and the reason why I've developed this PRL um, sequence on slide 23 is that at least within macro, it seems to me, we've got a lot of models developed at PRL levels, say PRL 3 at best, and then we're immediately jumping to try to argue on the basis of a PRL 3 model to argue that, that some policy or other should be adopted. And I just feel it's, it's not that the PRL3 model is not useful, it's heuristic, it's useful, you know, it's, it's suggestive and all of that, but it's not ready for policy implementation. You can't, I, I feel it's a premature jumping 
from a low PRL level to a high PRL level, like PRL 7, 8, and 9, it's a premature jump uh, that we are making in many macro studies. Uh, 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 too premature because the model does not incorporate enough fidelity, empirical fidelity. So I'm, I'm, I'm just arguing that we don't, you know, in, 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 in economics at least, the toolkit should include models at all of these levels uh, to enable us to proceed in a systematic way all the way from conceptual formulation to real world implementation. All of these models are important. They're all useful. And we keep arguing, it seems to me, at cross purposes, if somebody working at PRL 7 is arguing, or 6, is arguing against a model at PRL 3 uh, without taking into account the different purpose of the model and the d degree of development of the model, uh, it just seems to me to be uh, a not very informative discussion. So uh, again, I'm not sure about geologists and I'm, uh, whether they have the same problem, but I know in economics that we are very much lacking PRL 4, 5, and 6 types of models, and that that's a very big detriment to doing useful policy analysis, I believe, in, particularly in macroeconomics. Not to steal the time, I, just to follow up with, I'm curious, how did your stakeholders in, the, in Squaw Creek, uh, in the Squaw Creek watershed, respond to the ABM? What, you know, and how did they perceive, um, perceive that model in terms of the standardized policy readiness levels? Yes, yes, I remember that you uh, did your land use sustainability through collaborative geodesign uh, paper. I was very interested to see how you had done this. What, what we did was we had a science communicator. We had two, actually two science communicators on our project team. And they actually restricted the degree to which the quote unquote scientists in the team could come to the meetings with the stakeholders. They were very careful about this. They didn't want to overwhelm the stakeholders. Okay. So um, I, it was an eye-opening experience for me because I had not done this before. But the science communicators then encouraged the two scientists that were allowed to come out of our team of eight, that were allowed to come to these meetings, to be very quiet and listen uh, in the initial stages. And so the point was to absorb information um, and suggestions from the stakeholders that we could then go back and incorporate into the model without, so we weren't there to inform the stakeholders, they were there to inform us. Um, and so they never saw, in the initial stages, they never saw the model at first, right? What we did was we simply said, we're thinking of, 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 of considering this or that or whatever. And then the stakeholders would comment on the appropriateness of this, and then they would continue on with how they viewed their activities in the watershed and what was important in, in, in those activities. And then we would go back and try to amplify the model uh, to incorporate more of that. But unfortunately, you know, it's a three-year project. And I guess I would say to you, in my experience, three years is no, not long enough uh, because you have to develop um, – relationships with the stakeholders. They have to trust you. They have to learn to trust you. And, and, and when they come to these meetings, when they first came, uh, we heard later they thought we were going to talk down to them and, 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 and you know, impose them or propose uh, regulations for them and all that. And so we had to really say, you know, no, that's not our goal here. We're, not, we're trying to do an ongoing collaborative learning, and we're trying to learn from you. And so that was very hard. And so, so by the end of the three years, we were just getting into this. And so I just, I think it has to be a longer term project. I don't know how, how what do you have found here, but, but maybe you could comment on that. But it, to me, it has to be somehow a commitment from the university to support a really longer term ongoing effort, uh, or it's just not going to work. Yeah, that that's kind of what we found in our experience, too. We were fortunate that we've strung together grant money for um, six, six plus years. And there were oh, relationships yeah. in, in our watershed before the grant money began even um, because of previous wow. work that parts of the team had done. And so, you know, like any of these, we have a lot of kind of anecdotal positive outcomes on the ground. Um, but, you know, I think the only reason that we're seeing any of that is just because there's been such a long, long-term connection um, yeah. there. I mean, yeah, like, 
our, our soil scientist, I think, has been working there since 2004, 2005. Um, so it, yeah, I, I, you know, and the funding aspects, um, yeah, I, that's a whole other uh, side, uh, side thing that I'd love to talk about, but I, I, I'll, I'll, I don't want to dominate the conversation here while we open up the, uh, for more questions. No, but I agree. I agree. I mean, this this is something that would be so useful for an, um, funding agencies to really think about supporting um, these ongoing efforts to to have citizen engagement in science. Uh, it's such an important topic, and yet the, the the grants are typically so short term, and then they they turn over the personnel at the grant funding agency, and so you have to convince a whole other group. You know that you're you know it's just very tough. Uh, <laughs> Very important yeah. work, but it just needs to be supported, I think, in a different way. Um, so, um, Brian, thank you, Lee and Brian. I have a follow-up question. Um, like, in the process of engaging with the stakeholders, uh, you might um, have uh, the, how to say, the declared uh, interaction rules, but um, do you find um, if there is any way to to model their uh, tactics in their everyday life with the policies or any kind of rules. To to model their that's yeah that's that's what we're trying to do, is yeah. And it, yeah. by the way, uh, the watershed project is one thing. We're also doing that in the electric power area. That is, we actually go to dinner, we talk, we meet. We're we're actually um, interacting with the industry personnel whose behavior we're trying to model within the models. These are the, like the system operators, the generating companies, the load serving entities, all of these different players in, in electric power systems. We are in, in, in uh, interactions, we have a group here, Electric Power Research Center, which has a lot of industry members. Um, we're actually trying to learn what's important to them and then we're trying to build into the models uh, the type of constraints and concerns and uh, uh, opportunities that these actual participants face in the actual system. So I, it, the watershed was just a three-year project, but we have a much longer, and I think in some sense more successful, um, effort along these lines in our electric power work because we've been interacting with these people since, you know, for about 10 or 15 years at this point. So, so. Uh, I guess I'm, I hope I'm answering your question. I'm saying yes, we're very interested in capturing their actual decision-making processes and the, again, the key things that they find or they believe are important to them. Um, having those aspects in the model so that when they when they look at what we're doing, uh, when they judge our our outcomes, uh, uh, when they collaborate with us, they feel that there's validity in the model. Uh, it may not be perfectly a prototype model, but it, it's got enough validity that they're interested in the outcomes. That's that's the important thing. Are are are, are we learning anything from the outcomes, even if they're at a, a relatively simple PRL level at this point, four, five, or six? Is there still some enough validity to the model that the actual stakeholders uh, want to understand what the outcomes are? Thank you. That's very helpful. And a follow-up question is that we, as the graduate student at the very early stage of our, our career, do you have any recommendation or suggestion that we, we can prepare for this, those longer projects? Like maybe we yeah. have the willing to do those things, but we don't know how to work in this way. Yeah. Uh, is anybody at... Um Michigan State, I mean, are, are people involved in these kinds of projects? Maybe not with agent-based modeling at this point, but do you know of people there that are involved? Yeah, in we have a... department, you've got, yeah. Yeah, we have a ahead, ESPP sorry. program, and it's, um, it's set up to for the, the, the multidisciplinary person to interact with each other. Oh, oh, great. Okay, yeah. um, I always, I'll just... I, I, I guess I would say to a, 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 a graduate student or a new or a young professional, first comes the problem. You know, what is the problem that you're interested in? What, what is it that you want to study? What is the issue? And then this is one approach, but there's, the toolkit should have lots of different modeling tools in it, right? So 
I'm only saying that ACE modeling, for example, should be incorporated into the toolkit as one additional modeling approach for problems in which, which you really do want to undertake exploratory studies without imposing preconceived ideas of equilibrium or coordination, this may be the tool to choose. But you know, for other questions or issues, maybe you choose a systems dynamics or an equilibrium model or, or something else. It really depends on the issue, right? So it, it, I always say to my students, you know, let's first get, get straight about what is the issue we're trying to study, and then let's bring to bear any modeling tools at all that might help us to study that issue. And I have in mind the, the person, the most amazing person um, that I've met in my life for this on a professional level is uh, Lynn Ostrom at Indiana. And I was so impressed when I was a new, a young, relatively young professor uh, with the way she built up her, her workshop there and her laboratory setting there with all kinds of people game theorists and mathematicians and economists and sociologists and all different kinds of people, all focusing on uh, specific types of issues like forestry issues for southern Indiana. So the issue is the primary thing. And then all different kinds of people uh, contributed to how we might study that issue. And among those tools was agent-based modeling as one, among many you know, tools that were brought to bear. And each different tool had its advantages and weaknesses. Um, but I guess within economics in particular, uh, uh, the big weakness I see that I want to address is this, this idea that one has to have an equilibrium model uh, yeah. And that what can you do if you don't have equilibrium? So that may not be the issue uh, in geology and other fields at all, but it's certainly a big issue in economics. And that's why with the ACE modeling, I'm stressing so, so uh, strongly the ability to do away with the need to rely on these additional externally imposed coordination conditions. You really can study a system under its operating under its own dynamics. That to me is a very important um, capability to have. And it may not always be the one you want, but it's an important capability to be available in the toolkit. That's all I'm, I'm trying to say here. Thank you. I like the idea of toolkit. Hello. <laughs> I'm getting all kinds of static. Apologize about that. I hit the wrong button. That was probably for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was um, getting squeaks and whistles and bells. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Lee, I, I'd be curious to hear you comment about, um, I, unless someone else wants to jump in with a question, particularly at Buffalo, um, if, if that's the case, uh, go yes. ahead. And uh -huh. Yeah, this is Chiu Yi from the University of Buffalo, and uh, I already using the AM-based modeling for about two years, but my current problem is how do you calibrate or how do you validate your agent-based modeling, especially for yeah. when you simulate some social behavior or social networks. So sometimes it's hard to do the validation for that. It certainly is. It certainly is. Interestingly, I find, for example, electricity on this score, you really sometimes find you don't have the right data that's even yes. been collected, right? So yes. it's, it's kind of like, if you think about it in the past, um, the, the, the need to st or the desire to study certain issues has then gone back and encouraged the collection of different kinds of data. And I don't, you know, big data is a is a big hot topic now, but but really there's a there's a lot of importance here in this big data era, meaning that we're collecting information of a different nature on the way agent we can collect information as privacy concerns, of course, but we can collect information on how people interact and and we can do it in a linked way. This is as as far as I can see, this is. I mean, we've had linked data for, for quite a while, but actually being able to link workers to specific firms, for example, so that we have the worker interaction networks within a firm, uh, this is uh, 
again, subject to privacy concerns, um, this giving us tremendous ability to look at network formation in ways we were never able to do before that are empirically um, validated or at least calibrated to empirical data. So I don't, you know, we're, we're at the beginning of this. Uh, people are collecting data of all kinds, but we don't really have it completely well organized. We, we have big data sets. We, we, you know, we, we, there's a lot more that has to be done to manage those data sets to make them available in useful ways, and on and on and on. So I think you're at the very beginning of all of this um, with all these new uh, types of data being collected on social media and so forth. Um, a lot of, whether unfortunately whether you want to or not, a lot of what you are going to have to do to, um, to empirically validate an agent-based model with very detailed interactions is you're going to have to, I think, um, contribute to the process of data collection and management, um, uh, or at least encourage that um, where it's not being done to the point that you need. Um, and that's certainly what has been happening in electric power, for example. Uh, the power companies uh, traditionally masked a lot of their data. They didn't release it. But now that we have better and better uh, ability to model electric power processes through computational platforms, this data is really needed to create synthetic test systems. Lots of pressure is being put on the companies uh, to unmask, to a certain extent, to unmask some of this data to help us understand these processes in electric power. So it's a two-way street, and it's, it's, uh, you can view it as either an exciting opportunity or an unfortunate obstacle that you're at kind of the beginning of this process uh, in terms of the big data. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's very, very helpful for that. We have time for uh, one more brief question. Uh, we'd like to get out of here pretty close to right at 11, though, um, if anyone has one. I, I, have, uh, I have one if no one else does. Go ahead. Okay, well, I'm, <laughs> okay wonderful. Um, Lee, I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, so you know that I, I often end up looking at economics through computer science, um, and there's a lot of computer scientists that are now doing um, asking a lot of economics type questions and you know doing so in in non equilibrium ways i'm I'm wondering from your vantage point, is the field of economics at at large more you know open to kind of non equilibrium ways of understanding economic systems now or is that just a product of my biased sample <laughs> I think in the micro area, the microeconomics area, people are looking at all kinds of interesting phenomena and um, looking at processes of all interesting kinds, you know, like matching processes, Al Ross' work and uh, certain matching, uh, Matt Pissarini's work and so forth. So there's a lot of interesting um, microeconomics and microeconomic foundations work that's going on. It's very much motivated toward understanding process. That's, that's great. My problem is I'm a teacher of graduate macroeconomics, and I see less progress in this area in terms of a concern for process. So, so my, if I, when I critique economics, it's not typically economics, it's macroeconomics that I'm thinking of that really this is a very important part of economics is to study the systems as a whole, and that we really need to be able to understand the, um, as, you, as you do, the power of, of modern computational methods to model these bigger systems. I think we, we have a lot of macroeconomists who don't yet appreciate the power of modern computing. And so this is where I, I, um, I get a bit critical. But I do think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in micro foundations. And again, people are choosing at this point, um, many are still choosing to use uh, traditional analytical tools. But as they run into these constraints and these inequality constraints that may be binding or not, and, and they run into these really uh, uh, difficult uh, policy uh, regulations that involve kinks and discontinuities and you know, budget constraints and so forth, uh, I, I, I'm hoping that, that um, instead of just smoothing over, as I just refereed last night, a paper that smoothed this over by assuming constraints are always binding, you know, um, 
you don't have to do that anymore. And what it's going to take to 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 convince, I think, a lot of people in economics, in particular, uh, 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 that they don't have to make these. Uh, assumptions they know to be empirically invalid, they don't have to make so many of these anymore if they were to uh, work with or themselves become uh, acquainted with these powerful programming languages like Java, C++, Python, and others. Um, at least in economics, we don't require these program uh, or these programming languages for for our graduate students. We should. <laughs> You know, it's, it's beyond understanding that we're still having no computer requirement in my department for our students. It's like not having calculus. <laughs> I can't even imagine now not having the calculus. But it, it's, it's that important, I think, to have computational tools like computer programming um, uh, for, for people undertaking studies of these very complex systems. And uh, we're just not there yet, at least in economics. I don't know. What about your departments? Do you... Do you require your students to have computer programming? We don't at this point. Um, really? Unfortunately. No. Oh my. Okay, so it's not just economics. Hmm. Oh. Yeah. Um, well, though GIS is moving more towards that way. So. Yeah. Um, well, I um, that I takes say, us but to the end of our time. Rather 11 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. But that's that's well, a huge thank you so a much. huge uh, detriment. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. If I can interrupt Lee. Uh hi, this is Beth Allen. Oh, hi. Heavenly days. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to join remotely in my, in my office and couldn't see anything. So I just walked over here and thought I would catch you at the end. Oh, uh huh. Well thanks for joining. Okay, so I, this, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say anything because Brian Brian wants you to come. My, Brian is supposed to have stopped us at eleven, so I'm. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Well, um, so I, I, I'll say thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining the webinar, and um, so uh, and thank you, Beth, for coming over to say hello. <laughs> um, and uh, Lee, just really thank you so much for sharing uh, your insights and and your wisdom about the modeling process. Um, with, with the group of us, and um, we, you know, we, we look for, forward to continued conversations in the future. Sure, and if, if you do post this, uh, I, would, I would like to um, have that posting that I can, that link that I can uh, give to people here that are asking the same kind of questions. So Most definitely. I don't know if you're going to post this or not, if you're going to post it or not, but if you are. Yep, we uh, we will, and we'll we'll let you know all those details. So um, okay, with that, I'll uh, we'll we'll let everyone sign out um, at the at the other institutions. And um, thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you at the next conference. <laughs> yes. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.